so let's begin. Very happy Republic Day to all of you. I see a few new faces, so I'll just begin with a short introduction of myself and my colleague. Uh, my name is Suman. I am part of the Takshashila uh, team. And uh, Open Takshashila is our latest endeavor to take public policy to everyone. Okay. So on Open Takshashila, we do uh, open courses, we do events. We, it is a discussion forum on everything public policy. Right. So this is part of, on Open Takshila. We also have a book club, which we call as Page Turners. And this is part of that event. And it is wonderful that it coincidentally is on Republic Day. And we have a great fortune of having with us Professor Achut Chetan. Okay. So um, Kathy, will, Kathy, my colleague, will take over from here. And... Uh, we hope to have a fascinating discussion on everything about the constitution, especially this lesser known fact about constitution, women in the constitution. Thanks everyone for joining in and I'll hand it over to uh, Kathy Wright. Yeah, uh, thanks Suman. And uh, so for the for today's uh, Republic Day special edition of Page uh, Turners, we have with us Professor Archur Chetan, who will be discussing his book, The Founding Mothers of the Indian Republic. Uh, professor Chetan is Professor of English and the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. Uh, in his book, he uh, has uh, dealt with uh, the topic of uh, the, uh, uh, he, he has tried to uncover the stories about the founding mothers and the contribution that they had in the framing of our constitution, a topic that we almost have uh, forgotten in our uh, discourse. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Chit Chetan and tell us more in detail about uh, about his book and the stories of the founding mothers. So uh, welcome, welcome, Professor. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so... Uh, uh, why, why don't you begin with telling us the story of wha what is it about this topic that fascinated you? Because you have been researching this topic for a very long time in, and you have done your thesis on this topic and then you have uh, uh, written this whole book about it. So please tell us about your journey of this book. Uh, well, that would be a very long uh, journey <laughs> to describe because... Uh... I began working on uh, this in this area very early when I was a student of masters when I was doing my English masters and um, so yes the primary question that uh, came to my mind was about the authorship of the constitution so when we study literature we usually think of interpreting a text and among the various factors that we count in when while we try to interpret or understand a text is the fact uh, about the author of that particular text. So who has written it? Uh, uh, just a second, I think. Uh, yeah. So in the course of uh, my studies, I was a little intrigued by the phrase founding father, you know, because whenever we talk about the constitution of any country, not just India, we associate that with uh, the authorship of that text with a set of people called the founding fathers, you know, and that's a phrase that has been there in public memory since the American Constitution's founding uh, framing uh, in the late 1780s. And then uh, we, we associate uh, these founding moments as great moments in the history of any nation. So I was uh, a bit, uh, uh, I would say, uncomfortable with the idea that the constitution of a great nation like India and a, a nation which has seen a feminist movement and women's uh, active participation in its nationalist movement in all kinds of movements for social transformation uh, could have been written only by founding fathers. So that was one uh, intriguing question that I had. Uh, to be very honest, when I started working on the book uh, sometime in the early 2000s, say 2004, five, uh, actually to be more precise, uh, faith in the Indian constitution was not very high, you know, as, especially in the academic circles, in the political circles, the constitution was not so much referred to as it is being done now. And for various reasons, and one, one, what could say that uh, either the people who were working on the constitutions were not working with the right intent, with sincerity, 
or maybe there's something intrinsically wrong about the constitution itself. And somehow or the other, the, the second idea that there is something uh, wrong about the constitution and the fact that it was drafted by the founding fathers created a kind of a grid of misunderstanding in my head. So I also started wondering and, and feeling that maybe this is not the best constitution that we have. And it is part of the reason is that it was not drafted by a very gender just or gender equal uh, body of people. Uh, and, and I'm uh, I, I must admit that I was also I I call uh, I I say that I was misled by mm -hmm. academic scholarship of the constitution too, because uh, academic scholarship did not really look into many of the fascinating gendered dynamics of the Indian constitution, uh, some of its fabulous contribution to feminist jurisprudence in the world and in Indian polity and in Indian administration. And of course, the work, uh, the, the judgments of the Supreme Court also did not help very much in this. So I began with this misconception, uh, working in a kind of a paradigm where I thought that, okay, I can probably say that the constitution is also one of the causes or one of the, one of the you know, uh, one of the uh, is part of the problem. You know, India is not a just country, and there are lots of uh, problems. Gender, gender asymmetry. There are uh, there are incidents of violence against women. There's structural inequality and discrimination against women and other genders. So I, I I thought that the constitution is part of the problem, and that is how I started working on this. But somehow or the other, uh, I I think I was set onto the our path of looking for these things in the archives. My father is an old-fashioned lawyer, and he told me that you should not uh, have such a hasty conclusion about the Constitution uh, without uh, or before looking at the real documents. And you must uh, know that there were uh, 10 to 15 women who were also members of the Constituent Assembly. And then I started looking at the names, and I found that, of course, all these women were very well known, and they were uh, eminent women in their own fields. So it's... Uh, it was even more uh, surprising and intriguing that with such uh, eminent names on the list of the Constituent Assembly, how have we been able to forget uh, uh, them for 60, 65 years when I started working on the Constitution? The Constitution was 60 years old, or maybe less than 60 years old. So that is precisely how I started working on this. And uh, so my work became, uh, became uh, it had two twofold interests. One was the archival work looking into the actual documents, digging into the uh, documents of the make in the constitution uh, and to find out what actually happened. And the second was to also find out why do we forget these women? Because mm. that's uh, because I was also almost about to forget them, about to work on the constitution, trying to conclude that women were not there. So my work began like this. There's an archival aspect to it and there is a theoretical aspect to it. So you see in the book, is called Founding Mothers of the Indian Republic, which is about the women who actually played a very significant role in the making of the constitution. And the second is the gender politics of the whole framing, which is also partially about the gender politics of the remembering or forgetting of these women. So that's how it worked. And yeah. I, I remember that there was uh, always this critique that, um, you know, uh, the, the even the gender new some of the gender related rights that we have received are because the men were you know they had granted it to us right it was like the men had yeah. made sure that they gave women all the rights but as you uh, tell us in the book that it was actually the women who uh, specifically uh, fought and got those uh, instead of just getting man they made sure that uh, sex is also one of the um, one of the criteria based on which discrimination cannot be done. So, yeah, I mean, there are many assumptions that we kind of make and it's... Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I think one of the uh, major uh, things that I have tried to do in my work is to wean ourselves from certain pre patriarchal prejudices about thinking uh, mm -hmm. about constitution and, and rights discourse in this country. You know, somehow or the other, we have developed certain kinds of lenses which blind us to the presence of things which are very much there but we don't see it so that's something that we have done uh, the, the book has done um, maybe uh, one a way in which you can look at it so one part of the book or the first part of the book is largely about the pre-independence days 
you know, so before independence, before 1947 or 1946, when the Constant Assembly was convened, we already had a at least two decade long systematic institution based organization based women's movement in this country, which had developed its own moral imagination about what kind of society we want to live in, what kind of uh, nation we want, what should be the dynamics of relationship between male and female citizens, what should be the relationship between female citizens and the state. Uh, what kind of rights women should get in the public sphere, what kind of rights women should get in the domestic sphere, uh, about the rights of women in employment, about the rights of uh, women in terms of property, about the rights of women in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of their political choices. So there was a very sustained movement which was led by uh, the women who eventually got elected to the Constant Assembly, who actually got elected to the Constant Assembly is also, I would say, my patriarchal, you know, lingo that is saying that because they got themselves elected. It's not that it was some kind of an accident and they got elected. There was a, mm. there was a deliberate plan. There was a struggle. There was a hard, uh, you know, conflict with many other forces in the country, which uh, even wanted to stop them from getting elected to the Constant Assembly. So, so that particular part, I think, is where we resurrect these voices, this feminist uh, authorial intention, which, which could actually make a lot of difference to the make in the Constitution. Uh, if you allow me, I can just give you, just for, the, yes, for, for, my, for my audience here, yeah. two uh, organizations or uh, there was an organization called All India Women's Conference and there was Women's India Association. Mm -hmm. So All India Women's Conference, which is not the leading feminist organization in the country at this point, but mm -hmm. between 1927 when it was founded and 1946 when uh, the Constituent Assembly was elected, the All India Women's Conference was the leading feminist organization, not just in India, but it was also among one of the leaders to women's movement internationally. You know, and that uh, that organization generated uh, two kinds of things. One was a kind of detailed surveys, detailed data or statistical analysis of the actual conditions of women. You know, now in feminist parlance, mm -hmm use the term lived experience or lived reality of women, uh, a, a term which has been made very popular after Simone de Boer's uh, The Second Sex, which was written in 1949. You know, so much before that, uh, the All India Women's Conference with her membership of almost 30, 40,000 women and branches in almost all major cities and small towns in the country, undivided India, remember, mm. this, this is the India which would include Pakistan and what is the contemporary Bangladesh. So all over the uh, Indian subcontinent, it had branches and with uh, acute social scientific temperament, they did a kind of a research to create a full-scale understanding of the real status of women. So that became a kind of a theoretical, philosophical grounding on which they could base the demands that they were to make in the Constant Assembly. So that is one thing that they did. And the other was, on the basis of this, the kind of actual demands that they had. You know, So this is what we want. This is what we want regarding this, regarding that. And uh, so... Before they came to the Constituent Assembly in 1946, they had already drafted several charters of demands which were presented to the legislative assemblies in the country, to the colonial government, to the political parties, whether it be Indian National Congress or, sorry, Indian National Congress or the Muslim League, or even independent people who were fighting for women's rights or other, uh, other, uh, other rights. So that is something that they had done. They had generated, uh, and by 1944, uh, they had created this fantastic document called Indian Women's Charter for Rights and Duties, which was presented to the Constituent Assembly, which was circulated among uh, all the members uh, of various uh, legislatures in the country and also presented to the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights, was presented to all the international uh, women's organizations. And this particular charter, as Hansa Mehta, one of its authors, uh, said, crystallized 
the demands that women had been developing or generating over the last two decades. So uh, what I'm trying to convey is that women's coming to the constant assembly was not an accident, was something which was historically inevitable. And there was a lot of women's agency that went into bringing them into the constant assembly. And they came with ideas. They just didn't come as women. They came with feminists, with ideas about women's uh, lives. That's that's wonderful to know. Uh, but, but were they coming through a process of election? Because from what I remember, Hansa Mehta had to also fight an election. So a lot of these women had, uh, were they all elected or were they some also representing some communities? How was the process of them getting elected into the Constituent Assembly? Um, this is, uh, again, I, I think it's very good that you asked this question on the Republic Day and maybe I'll not, ju not just talk about women's coming to the Constant Assembly. This gives me a chance to tell uh, the uh, people who are listening uh, to this discussion about how the Constitution actually was made and how the members were selected or elected. So uh, there was a kind, there is a kind of an argument many people make you know, recently there are books which are saying that the Indian constitution is a colonial constitution and it doesn't reflect or represent all the views of all the people. So I, I think it's uh, good that we take a couple of minutes to understand how the constant assembly was framed. So yes, true, the constant assembly was framed uh, under the rules that were made by the cabinet mission. And the members that were elected were elected on the basis of their communal, I mean, community affiliation. Yeah. So, you know, so Hindus and Muslims and uh, Sikhs and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, this was done in 1946 when we had a full-scale election in this country. We had two important elections in this country. One was in 1937 after the Government of India Act 1935, which mm -hmm. is considered to be by many people as the founding document or the working document on which the Indian constitution eventually was made. And the second was this election of the 1945-46. And this election was contested by people from all political parties. The two major political parties then were the, uh, the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League. And the two major issues around which the these elections were fought were the partition of India. So there was this two nation theory. There was this mm -hmm. demand for partition. So one demand, uh, one one uh, issue on which this election was fought was the issue of Pakistan or the issue of a secular India, right? So the Congress party represented the idea that India is a secular country and we need, we stand by that. We do not need to, we do not believe that India contains within its boundaries an India and a uh, a Hindu India and a Muslim Pakistan. It's a secular country and we do not have necessarily, we do not have that kind of a divide. So that was a view which was uh, also on the floor of the, uh, in the, in the election. And the other was the concert assembly because it was very clear that from the members who will be elected to uh, in this election will be chosen the members of the concert assembly. So this election was mm -hmm. with a lot of, uh, you know, it was, it was fought with a lot of, blood and set and, uh, and a hard labor. So people fought uh, with great uh, passion in this uh, particular uh, election. And from this election, the legislative assemblies were created in all the important province, in, in all the provinces in uh, British India. And from within these legislatures were nominated the members of the constant assembly. These legislatures then elected their representatives to these constant assemblies. So for example, the Madras Legislative Assembly elected 10 members to the Indian Constant Assembly. And the Madras, as, as I've already probably been able to explain, the Madras Legislative Assembly, legis Legislative Assembly or Madras Legislature was already formed on the after this debate about the constant, uh, the constant assembly and uh, partition. Mm -hmm. So when people from Madras selected the members to the Constant Assembly, uh, they had two options. One option was that they follow exactly the command from the Congress top authorities. So Nehru and Patel uh, dictating that you send these members to the Constant Assembly. And the other was to also listen to what the people on the ground were saying. 
to be very honest it was not always that the legislative assemblies followed the orders of the high command so say for example sarojini naidu was elected from bihar and because she had to be elected the uh, congress party selected bihar from where she would be sent to the constituent assembly right mm. but then there were many other states many other provinces for example odisha that decided that we will send these people to the constituent assembly i will maybe in some uh, in, in in the next few minutes uh, we'll get a chance dakshayani vela yudhan for example mm. yeah. a dalit woman member the only dalit woman member elected to the constituent assembly was elected from the madras uh, legislative assembly to the constituent assembly and she was contesting her rival was a man who was also a dalit who was mm. then mayor of madras a very important member of the scheduled caste federation of india which was uh, led by among other people b r ambedkar and she was fighting uh, her election to the constituent assembly against this man and it was a very very uh, uh it was it was a very difficult contest it was a very ugly contest also in the sense that she was actually from kerala mm. you know she was from uh, 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 kerala and she was a malayalam speaking woman who was getting elected from a madras uh, uh, from the president of madras so people from madras were saying that we shouldn't elect her uh, then she was contesting against a male dalit leader right so that was also not taken very uh, uh, happily or lightly because in the past she had criticized ambedkar she had criticized some of the policies of the scheduled caste federation so they also thought that here is a woman who is being uh, who is be, uh, who is uh, betraying uh, quote and quote our organization but i must also add to this that she had also in the past criticized chakravarti rajagopalachari who was the most important member from madras legislative assembly and she had also in the past criticized sardar vallabhbhai patel you know who was uh, was of course one of the two most powerful uh, male politicians in the uh, within the congress party after gandhi so so her election was not an easy thing to do and so there was a madrasi man who uh, actually went on uh, a kind of a fast and to death that if you elect her then uh, i will die i will i will commit suicide there were letters written by uh, from the congress uh, provincial congress party to the uh, high command that you are selecting a woman from the constituent assembly of madras who has been uh, very critical of patel and rajagopalachari and the scheduled caste uh, federation was also very upset that here is a woman who does not do the line of the male party leaders of the scheduled caste federation mm. so the women who were elected to the constituent assembly had also had to go through this very difficult contest another example that i can give you is that of renuka rai or renuka rai uh, how do you pronounce in bengali we call her renuka rai so renuka rai was uh, between 1941 and 1946 a very important member of the hindu law committee you know which was suggesting reforms in the hindu law uh, hindu hindu personal law about the right to inheritance uh, right to adoption and and so many other things which are very central to the hindu uh, the idea of uh, you know the hindu community and there were vociferous uh, um, uh, resentment against her being selected uh, janki bai joshi who was the president of the all india women's hindu mahasabha all india hindu women's mahasabha wrote a letter to the viceroy sending uh, saying that this woman uh, will destroy hindu religion and she should not be elected to the constitution making body because if she, these are the people who will make the constitution what kind of constitution will get but renuka rai was of, uh, at the forefront of feminist movement in this country particularly fighting for the rights of hindu women you know the, within the personal law sphere so she got elected so her election was also not a very easy election uh, the all india women's conference had written letters to almost every single provincial legislature with a list of women from their provinces that these are women we would request you to nominate to the constituent assembly uh, almost all of them uh, 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 not almost so the, the list that the women circulated had around 40 to 45 women uh, but only 15 got selected and of those 15 uh, of those 15 seven were from that list seven were from other sources so this is how the constituent assembly was 
expected. And, and it's important to remember that getting into the constant assembly was a very coveted thing, even until the last day of the constant assembly, whenever there was a vacancy because somebody died or somebody resigned, people would you know, fight very hard to get into the constant assembly. So it's it's not that the constant assembly is was a non-representative body. It had a representation of all communities, all ideologies that were available at that point. Yeah, that this is a fascinating thing to know. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, Professor Chetan, so I want to ask one question and then I also want to open uh, it up for everybody else to also ask some questions. So before we do that, I one thing that I wanted to ask you, and it's a very difficult question for you to answer because that's probably the whole of the book. But if you can list for our audience uh, the... Uh, what were the major contributions that you can list that the founding mothers made in the process of uh, framing our constitution? If you can uh, uh, list for our audience and just elaborate on that, that would be... Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, of course, it's a very difficult question because as I say uh, in the book also, there is not a single article of the constitution of India which does not have an imprint of women's uh, intervention in the constitution. If they had not been there, all the articles that we see in the Constitution of India would have been different from what they are. So to identify one or two of them would be difficult. But I personally believe that the most important intervention that they made was in the structuring of the fundamental rights and the directive principles. As many of us know that the fundamental rights, very literally speaking, are enforceable and the directive principles of the state policy are not enforceable by a court of law. But if you look at the, uh, if you look at Article 37 of the Indian Constitution, it says that the directive principles will nevertheless will be nevertheless fundamental for the governance of this country. The word nevertheless, the words nevertheless fundamental were actually a contribution of Hansa Mehta and Rajkumari Amrit Kaur who were members of the subcommittee on fundamental rights of the constant assembly. And uh, mostly women did not want any right to be embodied in the constitution, which was not enforceable. For them, a right means a right that can be implemented. So to have a set of rights which you cannot implement is like it was a kind of a defeat. So throughout the making of the constitution, throughout the making of the drafting, uh, throughout the drafting of the fundamental rights, for all the rights that they demanded, they required a kind of a guarantee that these rights will be eventually implemented. And when uh, the Constituent Assembly finally decided to classify these articles uh, into two groups, forcible and non-enforceable, right, the fundamental rights and the directive principles, then they started trying to get all the rights that they believed were very important into the fundamental rights chapters. Mm. Okay, And when they failed even in doing that, or so far as they succeeded, they did, but when they realized that some of them, uh, some of the articles they wanted are not here, they also, uh, then they demanded that the directive principles need to be fundamental too. And that is how Article 37 of the Indian Constitution came into being. And I think it is the single most uh, important article in the Constitution itself, which has led to the ascendancy of the directive principles. Now it is impossible for the Supreme Court or any, any, any judicial judgment to ignore the uh, directive principles. Fundamental rights and directive principles are now read in conjunction with each other. The entire basic structure doctrine has now you know, brought both of them together. So the entire idea of what is a constitutional right, you know, is now dependent on that, I think, very effective intervention of the women's members of the Constituent Assembly. So that is the, I think, the structural or, uh, you know, interpretive uh, gain that we have made, thanks to the women members of the Constituent Assembly. Uh, the other articles, I can cite a couple of uh, them say you look at Article 15.3 and 15.4 of the Constant Assembly uh, of the Indian Constitution, which allows the Indian state to make special laws for women. So that's also something very interesting, and I cannot get into go into the entire discussion here. But very briefly speaking, when we think of uh, the right to equality, there are there are two kinds of uh, 
understanding of them. One says that it's just formal equality, and the other one says that there is uh, what we the constitution provides is substantial equality or substantive equality. I think it is with the help of Article 15 and Article 16 later that we have been able to construct an idea of substantial equality within the constant assembly. Uh, within the Indian constitutional discourse. And that has been possible only because of women's intervention. The idea that women did not demand reservation, okay, it's just a very uh, brief, very narrow understanding of what did women think about the right to equality. So women did not want reservations, but they did not. that doesn't mean that they did not want right to equality. Their understanding of how to ensure the right to equality was slightly different from what maybe the other groups, the marginalized groups in the, uh, in the constant assembly wanted. So 15.4 makes a special demand that these are the re areas in which we need to make special laws for women. So women were for affirmative action, but not affirmative action in a very paternalistic manner, right? So we need positive discrimination, but positive discrimination, not a kind of a mercy, not a kind of a privilege that, as Kathy said, you are granting to us. It is something that is inherent in us. So I think that is a very important contribution of women members in the Constitutional Assembly. Uh, the third uh, would be their understanding of the relationship between secularism and secularization. You know, women were... Uh, the women members in the Constant Assembly, primarily the ones who came from the AIWC, had a very defined understanding of what should be the role of religion in this country. As I uh, give the example of Renuka Rai, who was uh, at the forefront of reforming Hindu law. So there were many reforms that were made in the Hindu law or in the Muslim laws and so on. But the very idea was that religions role in the in determining the lives of women needs to be limited we need to secularize the society so that was something that was there from the very beginning uh, the right to free, uh, uh, you, if you look at uh, uh, the article about the right to freedom of practice of religion the freedom of uh, freedom to uh, freely propagate practice and profess your religion women had strong objection to the idea of the right to free practice of religion because they believed that the idea of religious practice contains a lot of things which would again allow religion to interfere in the lives of ordinary citizens. So secularization uh, and secularism, there is a lot where they contributed. Uh, one example, I will, the list is uh, very long, but I'll conclude with one more example. Uh, the idea of conscription, military conscription. Remember, the Indian Constituent Assembly was working in the aftermath of the Second World War. And almost every single male member in the Constituent Assembly, Patel, Nehru, Ambedkar, all of them believed that there should be compulsory military service, you know, in the Indian Constitution. Uh, military conscription was something that because that was the experience of the Second World War that most of these men were driven to. But Indian women, uh, uh, the, the founding mothers, as they call the founding mothers actually uh, did not like this. They objected to this and they finally managed to, uh, you know, convince uh, the Constituent Assembly that we do not need to have compulsory military service, partly because they drew upon ideas of Mahatma Gandhi and non-violence. And secondly, also because India is already a very large country and we do not need to compulsorily make anyone do anything. Instead, what they did was compulsory social service. You know, you, we all know there was this, uh, the, we used to have these schemes called National Service Scheme, NSS, in our colleges and universities. That came out from women's idea of compulsory social service that all young children or yeah, the youth of India who study in colleges or universities should give. So I think I, I'd just uh, sum it up here. There are many, many other examples, but these three, four would suffice to give an idea of the huge contribution they made. That's, that's amazing to understand. I would like to take a pause over here and see if anybody from the audience uh, would have any questions and then we can... Take it forward from there. Uh, Priyanshi Goel is raising her hand. Priyanshi, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Yes, thank you. 
So, sir, uh, since you just briefly touched upon this idea, I would just like to ask more question on it. You said that the uh, Indian Constituent Assembly was a very, uh, very representative, and uh, there were elections with regard to it. And now there are questions whether it's a colonial, colonial Constituent Assembly or not. But uh, I would like to raise one point that was raised by the people who say that it was a colonial constitution in the sense that the electorate in those uh, elections was very small. In fact, and even more so with regard to the women electorate, it uh, overall electorate was, I think, less than 10 percent uh, uh, or somewhere around this figure. And it went, it even narrowed down to women. So how do we justify with regard to that argument? Uh, thank you for asking this question. I do not mean that every single person in the country was, you know, represented in the constant assembly. That I think would be an ideal and impossible situation in any democracy. You can't have the voices of everyone. Even now, when you go for the elections, I don't know how uh, many Indians vote. I think we hardly get 40%, 45% turnover in our uh, electorate. But that's not the point. The point that I was trying to make was that the constant assembly was created within a colonial framework. But the people who are in charge of the elections try to ensure that every single voice was given a place in the Constituent Assembly. And this voice, I would uh, say, was not part of the descriptive identity, you know. So I, I would not be able to give you the whole list, but I can, uh, I can remember from uh, my work in the archives, uh, in the papers of the President to the Constituent Assembly, a President of the Constituent Assembly, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, you would see letters written by every single caste, subcaste, Sub 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 caste, you know. So we are from we are a fisherman community, which is very different from the fishermen of Odisha. So we want a representative. We are a committee a community of you know, uh, dhobis, and we want a representation. Adivasis were of course not represented as much as there was only one Adivasi representative in the constituency, Vijay Pal Singh Munda. So there were communities which were probably not represented in the way in which uh, a descriptive understanding of representation works, right? So your body represents who you are. Not in that sense, maybe, but in the sense that voices of all the communities, all the interest groups in this country were people tried to bring all those voices on board. So when uh, this is a question that uh, people often ask me that the founding mothers largely came from upper caste elite backgrounds, right? So maybe that is true. But it is not true that they represented only the interest of elite upper caste women. You know, there was one dark shiny Vela Yudhan and there was no Adivasi woman in the Constituent Assembly. Actually, interestingly, it was Jaipal Singh Munda who said, uh, the Adivasi male member, that we need more women in the Constituent Assembly. But on the other hand, you also have someone like Patabi Sita Ramaya uh, arguing sometime in the Constituent Assembly that 15 women have made life so difficult for us. Imagine what will happen to the parliament when there will be 250 women. Right. So there were all kinds of views there. But the point that I'm trying to convey is that representation in the constant assembly was not exactly a descriptive form of representation where only a Muslim will represent a Muslim or only a Hindu will represent a Hindu or only a particular community member X will represent the interest of that community. They tried to bring in representations, interests, uh, ideas from all the groups. That is why that particular uh, <clears throat> description about the feminist movement in India that I gave, that women did a kind of great social scientific survey about the actual lived reality of women, you know, before trying to present before the constant assembly that these are the represent, these are the interests of women that went into. So in a sense, they were also inaugurating a kind of intersectional feminist politics of ideas, if not uh, identities. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Professor. So second, uh, Stuti, can you please go ahead and ask your question? After that, uh, I uh, after that, uh, Sar, uh, Stushant, you can go after her. Hi, sir. Um, actually, keeping, am I audible? Yeah, yes. you are. Okay. Um, actually, uh, I was looking at the parade today and, uh, you know, the number of women who have been, uh, who now involve themselves through the March Pass and all the services. The question that comes to my mind is, um, 
because you also touched upon uh, compulsory conscription and the conversation about that in the constituent assembly was there any um like based or like very concrete opposition to full service by women in the constituent assembly was there a conversation that might have happened uh, it took us so many years about 70 years to allow women to get um to give full service in 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 combat roles in the armed forces um i was wondering if because of the extensive research that you've done if there were um like very strong opposition to that or if that conversation came up uh no i don't think the conversation was about women's uh, being in the army or military the conversation was about women, anybody's being compulsorily forced to being in the military so there's a difference so if you want to choose uh to be in the military i would suggest i mean i do not remember exactly any specific example but i will uh, this allows me to talk about something else um so <clears throat> the women's movement that i was describing which actually forms the background of their coming to the council assembly was fighting for the right of women to be in all kinds of employment you know so there were a number of areas in which women were not allowed to work it's not just uh the military women were not allowed to be in indian indian civil services you know if you remember the example of uh, cornelia sorabji she was a barrister but she was not allowed to practice in india uh one of the uh, other examples that i have and uh, this also allows me to talk about durga bai deshmukh so she was not deshmukh then durga bai wanted to study law uh in the in in 1930s and she wanted to study at bhu and she was told that this is not a profession for women you know women don't become lawyers and that inspired her even more this is she said no i want to become a lawyer and eventually she did become a lawyer one of the most uh, successful lawyers in the madras high court at that point uh, but so there were a number of jobs a number of occupations which were out of bounds for women women were not considered fit or suitable for them so the nine the women's movement was contesting this whole idea you know that yes women can be in all of these one uh, example that i can give is the example of mining you know renuka rai was uh, fighting very hard that women can work in the mines also you know mine was uh, mining was considered a hazardous uh, uh, profession for women and they were not uh, allowed to work in mines but uh, women's association said no we should be uh, allowed to work in the mines too Uh, sometime in the 1930s late 1930s uh, the international congress had appointed a national planning committee that came out with a fabulous report called women's role in planned economy you know if you look at that document uh, which was also co-drafted uh, co-authored by hansa mehta among other people you will see that there are descriptions and there are demands and recommendations about n number of professions where women should be allowed to work and should be facilitated should be trained given all kinds of facilities to work so this is where it came from so i see no reason why they would have not fought for women's right to be in the military the other twist to this whole thing is uh that around the same time during the second world war the indian feminist movement was also fighting against a kind of practice there was something called women's auxiliary corps you know when women were made to you know be auxiliary uh, components to the actual army and they were made to do all kinds of services that and that, that was probably not uh, that, that they, they that they objected to and so women uh, were fighting again fighting for the dismantling of the uh, wac women's auxiliary corps so their experience of women being in military was informed by these ex- uh, various incidents okay in the aftermath of the first and the second world war and so on uh, but the reason why i was i i took so long to answer this question is to also give you an example of the fact that uh, women were always not unanimous on everything so towards the end of my book i discuss a very uh, interesting uh, debate uh, on the indian factory bill that took place in the constant assembly in the legislative uh, form between dakshayani vilayudan the dalit uh, uh, women uh, woman member and renuka rai who was the not uh, non dalit uh, woman member about women's right to work in night shifts you know and jagjeevan ram who was himself a dalit uh, minister of the labor minister so dakshayani said that you cannot you you can make uh, uh, you cannot make this right implementable 
like women's working in night shift, unless and until you ensure safety and security for women. To give them this right to work in the night shift will only actually lead uh, to more, more oppression of women, exploitation, and women will become, particularly the Dalit women who work in these night shifts in factories and as, as laborers, they will be more vulnerable to sexual assault, sexual violence, and so on. So there was a kind of a debate whether women should work in the night shift or not. You know, so the question that was on the mind of the women founders was not just women's right to work in a particular place, but also about what kind of conditions we offer. We, we have the state has created for women to work in these places. So I see in this particular debate uh, an anticipation of the bill that we have or the act that we have of prevention of sexual harassment in workplace. So the workplace was uh, politicized. The workplace was thought about very carefully by them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sushant, you can go ahead. And after that, Priya, you can go ahead after Sushant. Thank you. Uh, Graham, sir, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, my video will not be available for uh, some reasons, but I'll just go ahead with my question. Yes, so uh, stemming from the same thing which you have just said, uh, I just want to know, uh, because we had a very solid uh, uh, example of the women serving in the INA, that is the Indian National Army under Subhash Chandra Bose. And they were not only in the rank of uh, officers, but they were also in the rank of sepoys there. So what, uh, despite having such a strong uh, kind of foundation, uh, there are uh, example which was there. Why did our founding mothers uh, of uh, constitution, they did not favor, like what you said, conscription was uh, not there, uh, that they, they did not favor the conscription. But why was the option not kept for the women to decide for themselves whether they wanted to join the defense forces or not? Nobody has stopped women to uh, uh, exercise that option. See, the Article 17 of the Indian, uh, sorry, uh, I think it's Article 18, you have to look at it. It says that there should be no bigar, you know, so no forced labor, labor, no compulsory forced labor. So all they wanted was that you should not make it compulsory for anybody to work in the military. So that, and that is all. I mean, the moment it's not compulsory for you, it means that you can exercise your option. That's fine, sir. But uh, what I understand is that the women were allowed in the military in not uh, like in the combat roles as recently as uh, like uh, in technical roles. It was, it was in the early 90s and uh, thereafter in the combat role recently, very recently. So why would I, I maybe uh, I'm not an expert on this. Why My point is simply that they did not want compulsory or using force to make anyone work for anything. That is my whole point. And especially not use force to make anybody work in the military. Okay, that is all I wanted to add as a kind of a contribution of these women. Now, the question that you are asking is probably about the women's movement in India and its position regarding women's participation in combat roles or not. So I would speculate that the founding mothers, the, the 15 women that I talk about, would not have objected to women choosing to work in the constant uh, in, in, in a military role. I will give you one example. Ammu Swaminathan, who was a member of the constant assembly, was Lakshmi Sagal's mother. So, you know, her own daughter was part of Subhas Bose's INA. So I would not ever recommend uh, or think that they would not have allowed that. The other uh, examples I can think of would be like some were tertiary, but women were definitely participating in rescue work in the refugee camps during the partition war riots. So they were going to Pakistan to rescue women. They were working in the refugee camps here. They were working in close connection with the police, with the other uh, uh, groups of you know state authorities to rescue women so it was never uh, uh, something like restricting women from doing anything the only restriction or the only uh, arguments for restriction that came was one from dark shiny which was about making uh, which was uh, which which just cautioned the indian state that you should think twice before opening workplaces for women unless and until you have made the workplaces safe you shouldn't open the workplaces for all women, particularly ones who are already very vulnerable and economically compelled to work in such places. So that is one. Uh, the other argument, I'm, again, I can refer you to a number of books is about women in sex work, uh, women who want to do uh, other kinds of works which were not 
quote unquote considered very Indian or very moral. So those were all arguments there and there were differences of opinion, but largely the women's uh, movement in India in the 1930s and 40s and by uh, 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 the founding mothers were in favor of allowing women or making all kinds of places available for women. Uh, that's quite a news to me, sir. Thank you. Thank you for very much for your input. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, like to know what books you would uh, want us uh, to read, especially when you have uh, referred to some just now. You told that there are some books which you would like us to kind of read. I, I think for this last part that was talking about about sex work and Indian feminist uh, Indian feminist movements relation to that, you should read Rajeshwari Sundar Rajan has a book called The Scandal of State. You know, it has a couple of chapters on uh, how this worked. Uh, I, I mean, not a book exactly, but if you, even if you look at Durga by Deshmukh's uh, memoirs, you'll find that she was very, very close and very, um, you know, closely associated with the sex workers. Uh, and and she, right from her childhood, she worked with them. Uh, she when she was in prison, she worked with them for their relief and rehabilitation. So so there were all kinds of positions, and 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 there was, I mean. Individually, I can su suggest a number of uh, books for each of these women who were involved in various kinds of activities regarding women's uh, uh, employment and work. But the one uh, document that I referred to early is the 1939 WRP, Women's Role in Planned Economy. 1939, mind you. No, I, I didn't say this. Women also demanded in the 1939 WRP and even before that in 1932 uh, in an AIW, uh, AIWC uh, annual conference that women's role as a housewife should be given its economic value. I mean, forget working in the military or in the hospital, even the work that they do as homemakers, right, should be given its economic value. That was also something that was part of the women's charter uh, of rights and duties that was submitted in 1945. So, so women were, in, in that sense, they were very, very progressive. You know, so some of these documents will be, I, I suppose, will be help, uh, very helpful for you. So, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Priya, you want to go next? Unmute yourself. Are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. Um, hello, sir. It really was a very fascinating talk. I've been meaning to catch up on your talk at some point or other. Uh, but uh, I had two questions. One was um, a lot of the women who uh, you mentioned um, who eventually went on to become part of the Constituent Assembly were uh, they played a huge role in suffragette movements, uh, both within India and abroad, and they were influenced a lot by suffragettes from uh, um, UK and from around the world. And there was a lot of influence from even uh, South Africa and uh, the places. So how, uh, how do you think their thoughts and their roles eventually within the constituent were in influenced by uh, world movements and um, you, you know by the conversations going on around the world about uh, um, women's rights i mean we didn't have to fight for our vote right to vote but uh, everything else uh, was pretty much uh, open and we were still part of the empire when this uh, conversation started so how do you think that influence happened and um, the second question was uh, post con the constituent assembly i mean a lot of the women three of the women stepped out even before the constitution started uh, its work say expressing their displeasure with the kind of work that was going on inside uh, malti chavri specifically mentions how uh, she doesn't like the fact that it was being influenced by um, the 1935 government of india act and so how do you think they perceived or did you find anything in the archives about how they perceived the constitution post 1950, post 2016, 1950, where they disappointed with what came out? Do they, did they think they could have influenced a little bit more? Um, did they have any sort of idea on what would be next for women in, uh, in Republic India? Um, yeah, two questions here. The first question I'll give you a very short answer to because that would take a long time. So, and that is something that I was working on, but I believe the work has already been done uh, before I could work more on that. So Rosalind Parr has a lovely book called Citizens of Everywhere, so which actually describes Indian women's movement and its participation in the international feminist movement. But adding to that, I would suggest, uh, I, I would say, 
yes both uh, it was it was a two way process indian feminist movement also influenced international feminist movement and the international feminist movement also introduced the indian feminist movement so it was a process it was it was truly an international feminist movement at that point and and that is where i will probably stop uh, talking more about that to take more time um, you may uh, you you have already said that uh, the right to vote was given to us but uh, it was not also something that was given to us as a free gift you know i would say that the fight for women's right to vote that was taken up in england actually changed the mind of the british colonial thinkers in india so uh, and and the indian men also here uh, regarding but connecting with the same question uh, the 1935 government of india act itself was perceived by the indian feminist movement as a constitution it was called the constitution and uh, um, i i do refer uh, to kamala devi chattopadhyay's uh, speeches about the constituent assembly uh, being convened at that point so she said that if we have a constituent assembly now we will end up having a very bogus kind of constituent assembly because it will be controlled by dominated by the bourgeois by the colonial people and uh, the colonized people so it will not really be a very truly indian constitution so that is 1940 1935 Uh, but again uh, even before 1935 we need to go to the 1931 uh, uh, karachi congress 1931 declaration of you know uh, fundamental rights that we had uh, i have a brief section there where i discuss women's role in the drafting of the karachi congress resolution so one has to understand that 1935 act comes after the karachi congress but does not incorporate any of the fundamental rights that were on Uh, that were being demanded those were all to come uh, become to become part of the indian constitutional discourse only in the 1950 constitution so this actually is a very uh, many historians many scholars have written about this so and that actually i think uh, uh, re resolves this whole confusion completely that the government of india act 1935 was largely an administrative you know prescription but the constitution of 1950 without the right to fundamental uh, without the fundamental rights chapter uh, i think one should not even be able to call the 1935 act a constitution so that uh, once you introduce the idea of fundamental rights you know it becomes a constitution so that uh, definitely happened uh, so what i what i was trying to say is that there was a skepticism in the minds of women right from 1935 about a constituent assembly they already knew that a constituent assembly which is not representative a constituent assembly which is derived by the state power of the colonial government right may not reflect the best interest of indian men and women okay they also knew that unless we have a ground swelling of opinion about an indian constituent assembly there will be no good constituent assembly Uh, the socialist uh, party does uh, the socialist party did not participate in the making of the constitution because they thought it's not representative enough but later on once the work started they realized that they made a mistake and kamala devi chattopadhyay was uh, uh, jay prakash narayan wrote to the president of india uh, not president of india the chairperson of the constituent assembly to jawaharlal nehru that you please elect kamala devi chattopadhyay to the constituent assembly but that was too late and she was not elected much later in her life kamala devi said that if we were elected if the socialists had not made that a uh, mistake maybe we could have had a better constitution otherwise what we have is a constitution which is which is socialist but not a very authentic socialist uh, constitution i think we need to repeat these words also because these are part of the preamble we talk about the socialist secular constitution so that happened after the making of the constitution uh, something very uh, intriguing that i would just like to share with all of uh, you here is that most of these women lost their elections in the 1952 uh, 1952 general elections and they lost their elections to people whose ideology they were contesting in the constituent assembly so renuka ray lost her election to the hindu mahasabha leader nc chatterjee from uh, west bengal uh, durga bai deshmukh lost her election to a communist leader uh, hansa mehta was not allowed to contest an election amrit kaur of course won the election and became the health minister of the first health minister of this country so it's not that the making of the constitution was the end of their journey after the constitution was made the aiwc amended its own constitution 
And they said that now our task is not, so far our task was to make a good constitution. Now that the Indian constitution is there, that, that should be the guiding light for our future activities. So they look at the constitution as very much a, a, a guideline for future activities. Renukare and uh, Hansa Mehta, I, I can cite many examples, but I'll just give you two here. Uh, Durga Bai and Hansa Mehta took education very seriously. Hansa Mehta was part of two or three very important committees about education in this country, where she tried to activate all the policies, all the gender equal clauses and principles in the, constant, uh, in the Indian constitution, and tried to make sure that that reflected in the education scene of this country from the primary level to the higher education level. Durga Bai made sure that everything that you have in the directive principles where, which are like positive injunctions on the state, right, is actually translated into action with the work of the Planning Commission, the Center Social Welfare Board, uh, and many of her own uh, personally uh, initiated uh, NG, uh, uh, civil society organizations. Uh, Renuka Ray took a lot of interest in the in making sure that the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes they get their rights as promised in the in the in, in the constitution so they took the constitution very seriously uh, they also initiated they did of course complain until very late that the united uh, uniform civil code the ucc has not been taken up by the indian state but that will be another long discussion but apart from that i think as long as they were all alive they took the indian constitution very seriously they worked throughout their life the rest of their lives to make sure that the provisions of the Indian constitution have a life in the, uh, have, a, have a real life. And, and all of them cont uh, contributed to this. Unfortunately, what happened is that by the 1970s, when we started having the second, uh, some people call it the second wave of feminism in India, by that time, most of these women, women were already very old or they were not very much into public circulation, they were not very influential, and somehow or the other they were marginalized. That's something that maybe historians need to research on. And that is the reason why, you know, when the Towards Equality report was framed, the, uh, the Commission on Women's Equality, there was not a single woman from, uh, from among these women. They were all very much alive. I mean, Durga Bai was alive. Hansa Mehta was there. Hansa Mehta was very much there until 2000s. No, early. So, so, but it was. It is sad that they were forgotten by that time. Uh, anybody has any other question? Suman, would you have any question? No, it's eight o'clock. I do have a question, but I don't know if. Okay, I maybe think I... you can. Yeah, please go yeah. ahead and ask. Yeah, uh, we've had so many of these fantastic women in the in the Constituent Assembly, but if you see, political representation has not changed at all, like for women as a whole. I mean, we've moved very very marginally on political rep representation in the country. What is it that is stopping political representation? I mean, I would have to speculate on this, but I. I uh, will draw on some of the ideas of the founding mothers themselves. So one of the ideas that I uh, take from them is that numbers are not very important. I'm not saying that they're not important at all, but numbers are not very important because as I, I, as I can see from this example, 10 women could make a lot of difference and maybe 50 could not have made the same difference if they didn't have the same kind of ideas. So what I believe is that unless there is a motivation unless there is a motivation among women that they have or they represent a very specific, very distinct point of view. You know, political representation of women will not, even if that is ensured, will not make much of a difference. So I always say that we don't need more women in the parliament. We need more feminists in the parliament, whatever be their gender. That's something that I say. But uh, from this, I understand also that women's own political uh, participation or women's participation in the political process needs to have a motivation from a certain kind of feminist perspective. They need to understand there needs to be this kind of a, an awareness that you represent a form of politics which is very urgent, which is very important, which is distinct, and nobody else can do it on your behalf. 
you know, once that particular kind of solidarity is created, I believe women's participation at the very ground level of Indian politics will increase. And that will then finally translate into larger numbers in the legislatures. Unless that happens, maybe through various mechanisms, through reservations. Now we have a 33% reservation, but I am not very sure whether this th these 33 uh, women out of 100 will make much of a difference. You know, unless and until that particular thing happens. So that's something that is there. And the other uh, lesson that I think the founding mothers have given to us is also the lesson of representation in the sense that even if uh, I know that somebody needs to be represented or somebody has an idea, somebody has a particular experience or somebody has a thought that needs to be represented, but that person is physically absent for a whole lot of reasons. I should be able to represent that. You know, we have developed over the last 50, 60 years of identity politics, a lot of suspicion, you know, about other people representing you. Yeah. And I understand that there's a, there's a particular reason and that's a very strong reason too, but we need to overcome this, uh, I think, deadlock. And the best example, these, these founding mothers here, you can see uh, Hazra Begum fighting for a change in the Hindu law, and you can see Hansa Mehta fighting for a change in the Muslim law. So this happens, you know. So this particular empathy where you can represent each other, you can talk on behalf of each other, will also make a smaller number of people more effective. You know, so so that is what I see as a kind of a future course of action. Thank you, thank you, sir. Deepak, think... you have your hand raised. Uh, last, very last yeah, question. Yeah, very last question. Yeah. So, uh, my question is, yeah, exactly. I think uh, what you said. I also believe that number don't matter. But today, if you look at the our current uh, uh, parliament or uh, state assemblies, there is this. Uh, whip, right? You know, the nobody has a voice, uh, including the women, because the party gives a diktat mm. uh, and they have to follow it. So I just, I'm just curious that when these constituent assembly debates happen, how were this, how was the process for every discussion, various uh, representatives were called out uh, proactively so that nothing is missed? So I'll be uh, I'd like to know how that really happened. Uh, very, very, uh, very, very important question, actually. And, and I believe on Republic Day, we must uh, talk about this. So I'll give you two examples before I tell you the structure. Or maybe just one example, not give many examples. So you were talking about the party whip, right? So in the constant assembly, Renuka Ray had a debate over the right to property and where she stood, uh, uh, stood up and took a position against the position taken by Jawaharlal Nehru. And Re Nehru stopped talking to Rin Kare for almost three months or four months. Okay. You can imagine Jawaharlal Nehru is the most powerful man in the entire constant assembly. He's the prime minister of the country, the most popular Congress leader of his time, right? Uh, many years being the president of the Indian National Congress. So I don't need to say how important Nehru was. And here is a young woman who is maybe 35 years old or 38 years old or maybe 40 years old, right? Who stands up to this, uh, this kind of a, a thing. And she says, okay, this is what I believe in. And you talk to me or you don't talk to me. And this is against the party whip. She's saying something which was not part of the collective decision of a particular party. It was, she was speaking her mind. Okay. So it's, it, and there are many examples. I can give you many examples of this kind of a, uh, this kind of a intervention that women made in the Constituent Assembly, where they did not agree exactly. And forget Nehru. There were many examples where they they also disagreed with uh, Gandhi. I've already given you example of Dakshini Vela who disagreed with Ambedkar from within the Dalit organization. So this particular thing, that's what I was saying. So once you start believing that you are representing an idea you know, and not just a number or, or a party, then it becomes easier for certain ideas to be placed on the floor. The question about how the constant assembly really worked, just very, I don't know how much time I have, this maybe take two minutes to explain this. So the constant assembly was created, uh, had a first session in December, 1946. After that, and all the 300 odd members participated in that, the Muslim League did not, the socialists did not, but the rest of them did. Then it created 
a number of committees, like specialist committees, a committee for fundamental rights, a committee for labor rights, a committee for finance, a committee for defense, a committee for language, and so on and so forth. These committees were smaller groups of people who would work together, who would meet up, who would present their own memorandum and then discuss the things. And they would make their recommendations and submit that to the advisory committee, which was headed by Sardar Vallabhai Patel. So this is, these are the several layers through which the decisions were went, uh, were, uh, went uh, to the advisory committee. Then the advisory committee would pass those uh, recommendations to the drafting committee which was appointed sometime in July 1940, August 1947, after the Constituent Assembly already had seven, eight months of debates. The drafting committee was then asked to create a kind of a draft on the basis of all these recommendations that had come. And this draft was then presented before the steering committee. So the Constituent Assembly had a steering committee and, and a rules committee. Durga Bhai Deshmukh was part of the steering committee. Now the steering committee, uh, it was the job of the steering committee to, to circulate this among all the members of the constant assembly and not just all the members of the constant assembly, but also to the public at large, you know, to the high court judges, to the important lawyers, to professors of law, to important citizens, important organizations, to important media groups, so that you could receive a response on all of them. Okay. And after that, the steering committee would decide that we will start the debates from, say, this date or that date on the floor of the Constant Assembly, article by article, clause by clause. This is how the debates went on. And each time uh, the debate, so people would give at least two days in advance that I want to say something, I want to say something. So their names would be there and they would be invited to speak. And they were not speaking from wherever they were sitting in the parliament. They would have to walk up to the uh, uh, front and from there they would make their point. And then if the drafting committee chairperson, that is Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, agreed with the suggestion given by this person, then he would admit that. If he did not agree with that, then he would see why he doesn't agree with the suggestion made by this. If there were lots of, you know, uh, con uh, confusions or there was a deadlock, then there was a kind of a voting by raising of hand. Okay, so you want this or you don't want this. If it became even more complex, then an ad hoc committee was created, say of four or five important members that you go and you discuss this again and you present your point of view once again. So this is how largely the... Uh, first draft of the constitution, uh, constitution was prepared. Once the first draft was prepared, then Dr. Ambedkar sat down with uh, after taking into account all these debates and prepared a second draft. That second draft was again sent to all the members plus all the people outside, including of course uh, certain foreign uh, experts. Then all the suggestions were given. And then they started debating on that. So the constitution of India, the, the constitution that we have with us today is the third draft of, of uh, the constitution that we have. And each of these drafts had to go through all these processes. So that is one part. The other thing regarding, especially about the women, is that these women, thanks to Durga Bhai, who know from as an insider that we are going to have a debate on Article 6 or Article 7 or Article 19, they would be informed and they would sit together, maybe at Barakhamba Road, residence of Amrit Kaur or Hansa Mehta's house, and decide that we are going to take this position. We are not going to say anything on this, but we'll raise our hand on this. Okay, And somehow or the other, they had a kind of a strategic planning as to what they will say. The other thing that they used to do, again, uh, something which I find very uh, interesting and uh, helpful for our current politicians, they would sometimes see that if we raise this issue, maybe we'll be defeated. So let a man take up this cause. So many a time, many uh, arguments that women wanted to be made in the Constituent Assembly were actually not made by a woman member, but was made by a male member who was a, an ally, who was a colleague, or who they had somehow managed to convince that you go and raise this thing. So this is how every single member got a chance to speak, to talk about their views in the Constituent Assembly, and that was incorporated by the drafting committee. And finally, the final draft that was prepared, even that was debated upon. And that is where somebody asked that question about the colonial constitution. So it was there 
that uh, these remarks came that this is, we have ended up making a very colonial constitution. We wanted the music of sitar, but what we have got is an orchestra or a symphony and so on and so forth. Some people said that, but I think uh, with this kind of participation of the members of the Indian Republic, we the people, I don't think we could have had a more Indian constitution than this. Yeah, that is just wonderful to know. And I think it's obvious, right? Because the, if there are going to be so many different voices, there would be a few people who would say that they do not agree with whatever has come up. So I think it's natural that that would happen in any case. Uh, but yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, I think we have uh, already uh, went past our head of, of our time, but thank you, Professor Chetan. If this was a wonderful discussion, I think I had a conversation with you on this topic earlier as well, but I think even the second time I find it equally fascinating. Uh, we have recorded this, so we'll put it out somewhere so that we can share it with others also. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, so it was else? a pleasure. And thanks to all the audience and the wonderful questions that allowed us to reflect on the Indian constitution at least today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, everybody. I think it was a great day to reflect on the constitution needed more than ever. And we can never stress the importance of going back to first principles on the constitution itself. So thank you all for being here. Thank, uh, we hope to have many more discussions. And this is a platform for discussions, Open Takshashira. So please join in when you can. Please bring your friends along. Please let everybody know because this is open to all. And we want to make this more, uh, you know, open, free, and um, yeah, whatever, open and free. So please join in, bring others, and make it a great place. Yeah. Thank we you. Have, we have this book club every month. So, and we actually have sessions almost every Friday where we try to do different kinds of things. So just stay connected and uh, if something interests you, please join. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Republic Day. Happy Republic Day. Let's make it happy. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs>